service today with hymn number 442, In You Is Gladness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered together here to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of his altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good. His love endures forever.
Today is Old Testament reading from the prophet Isaiah. This is what Yahweh says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am Yahweh, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, my, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, Yahweh, do all these things. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle today from Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to, to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of our Lord. In the Holy Gospel from St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please rise as we confess together our common Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and he third day rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, 
and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, over these past few weeks, we have seen some of the Pharisees' greatest attempts to trap Jesus. And today's gospel account, according to Matthew, is another of these attempts. And it is perhaps the most well-known of their attempts to trap him, as they used both politics and money to their advantage against Christ. And just as before, they have him don't they? If Jesus chooses to side with not paying taxes, the Roman soldiers are right there. They're in the crowd. And they will arrest him for inciting a rebellion of the people against Caesar. If Jesus instead chooses to side with Rome, the crowds who have been brutalized for years by heavy taxes will begin to turn on him. But as always, Jesus avoids their traps. And he gives his famous answer. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. But at this point, rather than continue the trap narrative, because we've talked about that at length the last couple of weeks, we're going to take a different direction. We're going to look more closely at that particular phrase, that particular statement of Christ, and what that means in our context, because there's an idol in the room, and we rarely, if ever, talk about it. In that quote from Jesus, what belongs to Caesar? Taxes, coins, money, that's what I'm hearing. Any other thoughts? What's that? Allegiance. The correct answer to the question is nothing. Right? 
Listen to the psalmist David as he began to write the 24th Psalm. The earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Jesus' own answer to the Pharisees is a trick because everything belongs to God. There are numerous Bible passages throughout Scripture that say the same thing. That's our topic that we often talk about as being stewardship, that we ourselves own nothing, that everything you and I have, even our very selves, they're, they're gifts entrusted to us by God. And so even as I will be going to the realtor in just a couple of weeks to sign away my house, we have to watch the language we use. It's God's house, not mine, nor the bank's, even though the bank will tell you they own it. It won't belong to the new family that's buying it from us. It's God's. Now this topic has been in the news a lot this fall. I mean, a lot. And even saying it that way is an understatement. Many of you are probably very familiar with the very disrespectful mark that the president of this land made publicly on Friday night, September the 22nd, when he called out the football players who would kneel during the national anthem, labeling them sons of, and I'm going to leave that blank, you can insert it yourself, but there are children in the room, so I'm not going to use the word. A league that is filled with division, that can't agree on anything, even their own rule book, found this statement to rally around. The protest that used to belong to just a couple of players most became the protest of entire teams. And nearly the NFL, the entire NFL that following Sunday, which we would call week three. I watched as a bloodbath ensued afterwards. Now, personally, you know I'm disenfranchised. I gave up on my team when they gave up on me. When they moved after some blackmail. And so I don't care. I can watch it from without. I don't have favorite players or a favorite team to make me angry at them. I won't talk today about how this is two sides that are speaking past each other rather than actually, you know, listening to one another and and learning from each other, which is what God would teach us to do. That's worth talking about, but it's not connected to what Christ was saying today. So instead, again, back to what made it interesting to me to watch the fallout that day and over the next several weeks, both in the media and and maybe your own workplaces and your schools, uh, news feeds on social media, conversations in the street, we watched as two of America's biggest idols went to war. And to my surprise, the NFL lost. Many of my Christian friends that day decided to give up on football. The flag won. We talk about false idols in the church a lot because we're idolaters. As sinners, it's part of what we do. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, temptations that Satan puts before us because it causes us to break the very first commandment, that you shall have no other gods. And anything that we put before the Lord is an idol. And the devil loves this trick. So we talk about it. We talk about false gospels, things like the prosperity gospel, which is indeed a false gospel. Last week, we talked about how we can put family and friends, hobbies or careers in front of the Lord. But this morning, we're talking about the false gospel that is patriotism, which thrives in this land. You see, it's a false gospel when we look for our security, our welfare, and our well-being in anything other than God himself. There was a really fascinating article on this topic from one of America's leading online liberal news websites. It was written by a Christian journalist, a man named Jason Foster, and I still have no idea how it got past their editing floor, assuming that an online newspaper has an editing floor, let alone 
how that article is still on their website today. But I'll let Mr. Foster challenge you with his own words from that article here this morning. The article he titled, Why God and Country Christianity is Just Another Phony Prosperity Gospel. He wrote, This form of American Christianity is a frustrating faction of the faith. There are passionate but generic references to God, calls for fervent prayer and public pleas for morality, but the alleged number one devotion to God is usually tied to a number one A devotion to the stars and stripes, as if one must always be tied to the other. It's a gospel that pays lip service to a God that's in control, but it's heavy on emotions that say man is really the one who protects us. In other words, it's a gospel that downplays or ignores the complete sovereignty of God. Among its other tenets, it's a gospel that suggests living out and sharing your faith is dependent on having the freedom to do so. It's a gospel that looks to the government rather than the church or the home to do the heavy lifting on matters of faith. It's a gospel that suggests without conservative Supreme Court justices or without guns or without a strong military that life would be unbearable for Christians. It's a gospel that suggests one's greatest source of identity and value is found in one's nationality. It's a gospel that laments the loss of prayer in schools rather than the lack of prayer at home. It's a gospel that dreads a future in which Christians are persecuted for sharing their faith, but puts no real emphasis on sharing it now. It's a gospel that says it's better to silence opponents than minister to them. It's a gospel that looks to Fox News for truth rather than the Bible. It's a gospel that says it's okay to put biblical teachings aside to make America great. It's a gospel that calls for blood when someone disrespects the national anthem. It's a gospel that, pay, that says persecution is having to hear someone say, happy holidays. It's a gospel that says eating at Chick-fil-A counts as living out your faith. Friends, it's simply a false gospel. That's a lot of false teaching that he challenged in a very short amount of space and it's interesting to note that he wrote that article over a year ago. This idol lives among us. To see some of my brother pastors overstep their bounds to protect a flag, a simple piece of fabric over the very people to whom they should have been ministering the gospel is depressing. The tab that I wear around my throat is a, a reminder that the words that I speak, I speak not of my own self, but I speak in service to his will. This tab is white because of the blood of Christ that washed away all of my sin, just as this, this robe is white. It's not striped red and white. While the separation of church and state is a false concept to begin with, and one that is pushed upon us not by scripture, but by the very state that would benefit the most from it, we do need to understand what Luther called uh, the teaching of the two realms. That God is at work in this world in two ways, two distinctive ways. On the one hand, God is working to preserve and to care for his creation. He works on this hand by establishing law and then by promoting justice. Now, on the other hand, God is working to bring people into a right relationship with himself. He's working on this hand to fully restore his creation through the work of his son and our savior, Jesus Christ, as he justifies people, not by their own works, but by the works of his own son, his own son's righteousness. We call this hand government, and we call this hand the church. They're not separate but they are distinct. They are two clearly distinct vocations. Now, two of the, the false ideas that go with a, a patriotic idol would be these. And you've heard these. Christianity is the American religion. And the other, America is God's chosen nation. Those are both false, but sadly believed by many. 
One Fourth of July Sunday, I can recall visiting a congregation who began their service with the, the color guard, the Boy Scouts, processing in the American flag. The congregation then proceeded as part of the worship service to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The hymns that morning were all sung in honor of America. And the sermon then was was spoken very heavily based upon the history of this being a Christian nation that we live in and then bemoaning the idea that the church has lost its prominence in our land and our culture. Imagine if we flipped that for a moment. Imagine if you were to go and visit a foreign nation. Let's pick a a nation that, as Americans, we don't like. Let's go with North Korea. Somebody has to take the risk and go and share the gospel with the North Korean people. So let's say you do, and you find some fellow Christians there, some brothers and sisters in Christ, and you go and you worship with them in their church. And as the service begins, down comes the flag for North Korea and the people around you begin to pledge their allegiance to the flag of North Korea and sing the national anthem. I have no idea what the national anthem over there is, if they even have one, but you get the point. Could you join them? Could you sing that with them? Or would it seem out of place to you? Didn't you go there that morning to to that church to be with those people, to worship together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, your Lord and Savior? Didn't you go there with them to to come to the table to receive in the fellowship of this altar the body and blood shed for you upon the cross? We have many partner churches throughout the world who fly no flags whatsoever in their sanctuaries. And do you know when we started? Does anybody know the history of when the LCMS started putting the American flag in the church? During the World Wars. When we were still speaking German, and Germany was the enemy. You remember historically how Americans treated the Japanese during the World Wars? It wasn't much better than a concentration camp. And so, the, the German-speaking LCMS people at that time wanted to prove to their neighbors which side they were on. Now allow me to take a step backward. There's nothing wrong with loving your country, which on the most basic level of the word patriotic is what that word means. There's nothing wrong with on the 4th of July if your pastor says a prayer uh, to the Lord for the nation. There's nothing wrong on Veterans Day to thank the men and women who have, who have given of themselves, who have sacrificed of themselves to serve and to love their neighbors. There's nothing wrong with being grateful for the land and for all the gifts that the Lord gives to us. There's nothing wrong with with caring about the land that you live in and the people that are living in it with you. There's nothing wrong with being concerned about the direction that things are going and wanting to see the country where you live reflect the truth of God's word. And there's nothing wrong with working diligently as a citizen in that land to make that happen. These are good things. The scriptures even tell us that we ought to pray for our leaders, which is why the weekly church prayer list that we have on our website lists names of of federal, state, and then even local government officials. This is worth your time. These men and women can use your prayers. The scriptures also teach us that we ought to encourage our leaders, that we should respect our leaders, and that we should only disobey them if what they're telling us to do is in contradiction to what God has told us to do. The point this morning is that we have but one Lord, and for him we are ever grateful, because it is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves you, not an earthly government. It is Jesus' loving and tender care that we are to trust that will keep us out of harm's way, not a military. It is his loving hand that provides for our daily bread and provisions, not an earthly economy. You and I are not defined by our American citizenship, but rather we are defined by being one of God's children, one of his holy people. And in fact, 
Today, in this culture, following Jesus Christ would make you a pretty bad American because this land is going in the opposite direction, choosing to reject Christ and to reject his gifts. And really, that's regardless of who's been in power over the past couple generations. It's not our job as Christians to assert our rights as Americans. Not really even to fight for those rights. This is a tough one, and I admit I struggle with it too. It's hard not to watch as we see some of our brothers and sisters in Christ getting dragged before the Supreme Court. But many Christians today fear that they are being marginalized, that they're, they're being pushed outside, they're being pushed away from the society that they've been in. That's not only true, it's also okay. I think you need to hear that. Really, it might actually be a good thing. History's borne that out. Do you happen to know right now in the world, globally speaking, where is the church growing fastest today? Yeah, a few of you are saying it. It's growing the fastest in Africa, where people each and every day are dying simply for confessing Christ as their Lord. Places like Sudan. You can be killed over your faith, and yet the, the church is blooming. And in here and places like Europe, places where the church has enjoyed a position of power and comfort for generations, it's in these places where the church is declining at its fastest. We've lost sight of what it means to be a citizen of heaven. We've lost sight of what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. We're not here to fight over rights. We're here to love and to serve our neighbor. Jesus once taught, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. From the Sermon on the Mount. We don't need to trust in our government or in ourselves or in our possessions to provide for us. The Lord will do that. The Lord does do that. The Lord cares for us. And this goes back millennia. God created everything. He created the entire world. All of this is his creation and he continues to care for it. This doubles back to the beginning of the sermon and talking about stewardship. We could talk about the Sabbath rest and, and how the Sabbath was all about trust. It's almost as though the Sabbath was God's way of saying, I built this world in just six days. Do you trust that if you take a simple day off every week, I can keep it spinning? That's kind of the point, even though, you know, he didn't say that. But the answer is yes, isn't it? God does not need his people to keep the earth spinning. That's his job. And he's been doing it for over 6,000 years. And it was about 4,000 years into that that God was not content with giving us our mere daily bread, but instead that God cho chose to send his only son, Jesus Christ, into the creation, to provide for our greatest need, to provide for our salvation from sin, death, and the devil. That he would take the sins of an idolatrous people and that he would choose to cleanse them in the blood of his own son. And that's precisely what he's done. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross for the very idolatries that you and I hadn't even committed yet. In him, we're already forgiven. And so now today, as the church, we are the very body of Christ himself. And the church exists in this place so that the gospel message of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed and that sinners would be justified in the blood of Christ. The more that the state pushes against that, the, the two realms, the more that the state pushes against the church, the more the church thrives. History has shown that to be true. Amen.
At this time, I want to invite the children forward for the children's message. Good morning. Have you ever seen a coin? Raise your hand if you've seen a coin. Yeah. What's on a coin? If you look at a coin, what do you see? A president. Yeah, you see some guy's head, right? Some, somebody's face. Each of our coins has a different president's face on it. What, who is the president? Who's the president? Okay, that's a correct statement. Donald Trump is the president currently. Uh, let's go with the job. What's, what's the president's job? To make decisions for the country. Which country? Our country, this one. The United States, where we live. The president is the leader of the entire country. Now, there's other leaders, too, and there's a whole system of, of how that all works. But the president's job is to lead this country. So Jesus is talking about a coin. Some guys tried to trick him and get him in trouble with the government. And they gave him, they asked him, should we pay taxes or not pay taxes? Taxes are the money that your parents pay to the government, and the government turns around and uses that money for the good of all the people living in the country. That's the way taxes are supposed to work. And so they're asking Jesus about the money. And Jesus says, give me a coin. And they give him a coin. And he, he asks, whose picture's on it? And they answer just like you did. It wasn't the president. They called their, their leader Caesar, um, a little bit of a different government. They called him Caesar. Caesar's picture was on it. And so Jesus said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God what is God's. Whose image, if we're talking about pictures, if we're talking about images, whose image are you? Whose image are you? Whose image were you made in? God's image, right. And so as Christians, as God's children, as his holy people, through baptism, through that wonderful gift, we are, we're God's children. And the Bible says we're citizens of heaven. So this morning we were looking at, in the sermon, our relationship as Christians, as people who live in this country. What is our relationship to the government, to the president? How do we, how do we work together? And what's that look like? So I wanted, to, I wanted to summarize that for you. As Christians living in a, in a land, we, we are told by the scripture to respect the government. What's it mean if we respect someone? You guys know this one. You know what it means to respect someone. To be kind to them be nice to them, okay, to listen to them, right, to honor them, to uh, oftentimes obey them, right, you're supposed to respect your parents, I think I heard that somewhere before, have you heard that, yeah, you have, okay, so our parents are a gift from God to, to lead us, to serve us, to help us, to, to grow and to be to be his people in this place. Our government is very much the same. Our government is a gift from God to lead us and to lead us well. And so they're to serve us. And in response, we actually, we serve them too. There's a lot of ways that we can serve in our country. We can serve our neighbors, we can serve our loved ones. Um, and. And just simple stuff. I mean, it's not hard to love your neighbor. 
well, we're sinners, and in that sense, it's hard to love your neighbor, but you don't have to go out and do these ginormous things, these great, wonderful things. Loving your neighbor is a simple daily thing to do, just like it is to, to honor your mother and your father. That's just something that you're supposed to do every day. And so we, we honor and respect our government every day as well. What are some ways that we can honor our government? What can you think of? We're going to do one in just a couple minutes. Let's pray for them. You ever pray for your family? Yeah. Your government is another one that you can pray for. You can, so you can pray for them. You can, you can, you can thank God for them. You can also ask God to, to help them, to help them as they're leading you, to give them guidance and wisdom as they lead. We can... Well, we talked about how the, the government is one way God works in the world and the church is another way God works in the world. As the church, when the government's doing good stuff, we can, we can actually say thank you. We can encourage them. We can tell them, hey, you're doing good things and that's good. Keep doing it. If the government starts doing things that they're not supposed to do, as the church, it becomes our responsibility to say, hey, you're doing things that aren't good, that aren't helping people. Knock it off. That's part of honoring and respecting someone too. When you love your neighbor and your neighbor is doing something that hurts themselves, part of loving your neighbor is saying, hey, you're hurting yourself. You shouldn't do that. And so we do that for our neighbor. We do that for our parents. We do that for our government. We do that for anyone and everyone that we can. That's part of, of what it means to love someone else, to respect someone else. Let's, let's say a word of prayer and thank God for the gifts he gives. Heavenly Father, we, we indeed thank you. We thank you for, for the gift of authority for our parents, our government, our, our schools, all the other leaders, those who, who would take care of us and teach us and, and help us to grow. We indeed pray for guidance for, for them, um, that daily you would be with them and bless them as they, they work in this place. We also pray that you would help us to honor and respect the people that you have given authority. We pray today a prayer of thanksgiving, most of all, for your son, Jesus Christ, who, whose death on the cross forgives us of our sins and whose, whose resurrection from the tomb gives us life. And we thank you for, for all these wonderful gifts. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. You can go back to your families. We have several updates to the prayer list this morning. Uh, we had two of our members of our congregation lose uh, family members who, who died earlier this week. So we'll pray for, for Rose Buns, whose sister Nancy died on Tuesday. Um, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. Um, Stolhonks, maybe, is, is my best shot. So, but we pray for Nancy's family and friends. Nancy leaves behind her daughter, Heidi, and son, David. Uh, and so we certainly pray for all of them at this time. We also pray for Carla Blahnik. Uh Carla is, is not with us this weekend as she's with her family uh, mourning the loss of her father. So we'll be praying for, for both families today. Yesterday, Kevin and Samantha uh, Welter were united in marriage here at the church. And so we'll give... Thanks to the Lord for that wonderful gift and pray for their, their life together as, as they move forward. We also will be praying a prayer of safe travel. Uh, Pastor Fritch and Connie driving back today from Maryland. We'll pray for Larry Gilbert who's been hospitalized with pneumonia over the weekend here. Uh, we also pray for Pat Bannett who is Jenny Loris' mother. Uh, Pat had her knee replaced earlier this week and she's doing well but the prayer that she would continue in that recovery we pray for Dorothy Shepherd today. She fell in her home and, and broke her hip uh, earlier this week. She had surgery performed yesterday, a partial hip replacement, and so we're thankful that that surgery went very well, um, and we will pray for her recovery uh, moving forward. We also pray for Blake Eikhoff, as he will be preparing for, for surgery tomorrow uh, to have the tonsils out. So we'll lift him up and his family as well in our prayers. Please rise as we join together in prayer.
Lord God of heaven and earth, we thank you. We thank you for your diligence and love and care for us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to redeem and to restore your creation unto yourself. We pray today for all who serve in this land. We pray for our United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. We pray for the House of Representatives in our state, for Nels Pearson. And we pray for our local county uh, board of commissioners. We ask for these and for all others who serve that you would indeed be with them, bless them, guide them, help them to lead well. And if they don't know you, Lord, uh, we certainly pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit upon them that they might come to know you and to know the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, that, that, that leads us to love our neighbor. We also pray today for your help and your blessing to be with all those uh, still being devastated by the fire in California. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who have lost livelihoods. And we indeed ask that you would be with, with them at this time and also with those who are working to, to fight and to restore uh, peace and, and just a general sense of, of livelihood in that community. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for Rose and, and Heidi and David as they mourn the loss of Nancy and for all other family and friends. We pray for Carla and her family and friends as they mourn the loss of her father. We pray these things, Lord, trusting and knowing that these, these two people are your children and that the hope and the power of the resurrection would bring comfort and grace and mercy into their lives at this time. Be with them as they grieve. We also pray for your blessing that it would be upon Kevin and Samantha uh, as they indeed enjoy the gift that is marriage that you have blessed them with uh, just yesterday. We pray that you would be with them, that Christ would be the foundation of their home for years to come until he returns. We also pray for Pastor Fritch and for Connie as they are making their journey home. We ask, Lord, that indeed you would be with them, watch over them, uh, protect them on their drive, that they may return to the vocations here in this place that you have given to them. We pray for all who are sick, for all who are hurting. We pray for Larry Gilbert, uh, that you would help him to overcome his pneumonia. We pray for Pat Bannett and Dorothy Shepard as they each recover from their replacement surgeries, that you would keep the pain uh, to its minimum and speedily aid their recovery. We pray for Blake Eikhoff, indeed, uh, that the surgeons would be guided in their work, that you would, would be with them, uh, that they may successfully perform surgery tomorrow and that Blake will recover quickly uh, and we thank you for the gift of parents and, and his brother and sister who will love on him in the week ahead. We also pray for Michelle Griffiths as she continues to regain strength. Lord, we ask that you would, would strengthen her spine, strengthen her legs and give her that gift of walking freely again. We also pray for Lyndon Luke as he battles cancer. We lift up to you all of these, your people, and entrust them into your most precious and wonderful care. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we will be collecting the offering. We welcome our guests and visitors here with us today and wish God's blessings unto each of you.
At this point in the late service, we will be having the milestone blessing for the, the families of, well, the, the birth group, uh, the children that are already born, uh, that'll be, they're three years out from school yet, but that, that group together has been looking at what the importance of baptism is in our life as Christians, and then also the gifts that um, God has given to them to begin to teach their little squirmy ones about God in the home. Uh, so it's a wonderful blessing indeed, and uh, we're, we're thankful for those families that will be gathered again in Sunday school and wrapping up their time together for that class. We invite you to rise as we celebrate the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. And give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on us, children of men, and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that he may establish in us a living faith, and prepare us joyfully to remember our Redeemer, and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And once he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, then, also after the the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks for it, he blessed it and said to them, Take and drink. This is the blood of the covenant, which is given for you. For the forgiveness of your sins, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ both strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith until life everlasting depart in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace.